Um, let me introduce oh. to you everybody, um, Chris Rowan. Chris Rowan um, is an impassioned occupational therapist with firsthand understanding and knowledge of how technology can cause profound changes in a child's development, behavior, and their ability to learn. Chris received her Bachelor of Science in Occupational Therapy in 1989 from the University of British Columbia, as well as a Bachelor of Science in Biology and, ha and has an SIPT Certified Sensory and is an SIPT Certified Sensory Integration Specialist. She's a member, um, she is a member in good standing with the BC College of Occupational Therapists and an approved provider with the American Occupational Therapy Association and the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists and Autism Community Training. For the past 15 years, Chris has specialized in pediatric rehabilitation, working for over a decade in the Sunshine Coast School, School District of, Brit of British Columbia. Chris is CEO of Zoned In Programs, Inc., offering products, workshops, and training to improve child health and enhance academic performance. Chris designed Zone In, Move In, Unplugged, and Live In educational products for elementary children to address the rise in developmental delays, behavioral disorders, and technology overuse. She's performed in over 200 foundation series workshops on topics such as sensory integration, attention and learning, fine motor development, printing, and the impact of technology on children for teachers, parents, and health professionals throughout North America. So we are really looking forward um, to this call. And uh, Chris, we welcome you to the call tonight. Thank you, <laughs> Melissa. So thank you for coming to this uh, topic. Uh, I'm a pediatric occupational therapist and have been working in the field for just about 23 to 25 years. I have two kids myself. During that time, I've had the opportunity to witness a profound change in our children, in how they play, in um, how they learn, in what they do if, from uh, socializing to um, uh, different activities and I've been watching with interest the impact particularly of uh, different technologies on those those activities of children and I've seen a real a real shift toward what um, I would call very unhealthy children and so I really welcome you today to uh, look at this more in depth and to explore some of the the uh, possibly negative effects that technology is having on children and what can you as, as parents do about it. So uh, without further ado, we're just going to start into our slideshow. We're um, uh, running for an hour tonight and then we also have a second uh, part two to this series that will be airing and I'll, I'll come up with the date in just a few slides. So this is what we're seeing now with our 21st century family. Everybody's got their own device. They're very, very busy. Um, meals have pretty much been um, invaded by devices. Everybody's got something vibrating or, or calling to them with their own little ringtones. Um, here's our new millennium child, heavily engaged in um, oftentimes violent media content and um, very, very, um, uh, hyper stimulated over stimulated with with these technologies this is how our new generation uh, communicates is through what I, I term an interface so um, a lot of the face-to-face -face interactions the face-to-face -face play has been replaced by this um, interacting through an, an interface and this is how many of our children are learning. Um, whole schools in the U.S. are now going toward using iPads, even from, from kindergarten on. Um, they call it the $100 curriculum in a box. You can, um, a school can place like all their curriculum on a device. And uh, in many of the, the articles I've read, they're viewing or calling the teacher um, more of a monitor of the learning process that the device will actually be, you know, teaching the child. So these are uh, the, the, the face of so many aspects of our children is, is changing very, very rapidly. Um, this is the one that concerns me the most. I'm a, a child development specialist, pediatric occupational therapist, and I, I just, um, uh, development is all about 
play or development happens during play. So whether it's social development or physical development or mental development or academic uh, development, so much of it is enhanced through what children do through the environments they're exposed to and, and the type of play they're engaged in. And so um, as you can see now, our, our children's lives have been very changed in, in um, the way that they play. And this is what we term parallel play, where there isn't a real interaction between um, the, the two children there. It's, it's uh, through, again, through the device. So I'm not against technology at all. We, um, we have so many uh, wonderful, wonderful things that come to us through technology, and, and it has an immense capacity to teach children. But what's happening is, is our kids are using too much and too early, and it's really detrimental to their development. And I say to parents, any time a young child spends with a device is detrimental to their development, and you'll, you'll see why as I, as I go along. So what I advocate for is that we, I, I've developed a, a concept that I term balanced technology management, or BTM that what we, we want to try to do as parents is, is manage this balance between tech use and healthy activities, which are real critical factors for, for child success. And, and those, those are many. There are many you know, critical factors that, that we need to expose our children to in order to create a healthy, happy, successful child. But uh, as an occupational therapist, I'm, I'm gonna talk about four um, tonight. One is movement touch, human connection, and exposure to nature are, are four very critical factors for child success. So I, I want to start by showing you a slideshow that is um, accessible through my website, Zone and CA, and it's called Suffer the Children. If you go on the website, it's down at the bottom, there's um, a section for video, uh, video clips, and this is one of them. Um, as you go through tonight's workshop and then the part two workshop, you'll get a lot of information and it's research reference, meaning that um, I'm, I'm quoting different research articles. It's quite overwhelming. I've had many um, parents tell me this when they first start uh, understanding the, the real impact of technology on their children. And they often say, what do I do? What do I do? Um, how, do I, how do I go about um, making changes in my life so I can move more toward this balance perspective. So I created this slideshow and it's specifically for parents to go back and show to other parents, old, some of their older children, um, and, and to create dialogue because the worst thing you can do is is you know call up a friend or your partner or you know your kids and say look look we you know I learned all this stuff tonight and, you know we've got to completely change our lives and and um, you know it's going to be really different around here now and let's throw out all those you know those devices wrong thing to do um, many children in fact they're estimating now eight percent of children have addictions to devices uh, adult addictions are now the most um, the most common mental health disorder for adults is internet addiction. So um, we can't just throw these things out. We can't just make sudden changes in our lives or in the lives of, of our family, especially if there's a real heavy uh, use problem happening there. So first thing we want to do is what you're doing right now is get more information. And so you're getting this information. So what you can do now is turn around and um, provide that in information to other people through a number of, of um, things that I'll point you to tonight. So uh, we're going to start by just showing some of the statistics on, on impact through um, having you watch the slideshow. It's uh, four minutes. Thank you. 
So there's an, another um, short video clip on the website called Reality Check, located in the same area as Suffering the Children, which is just about a minute, and it's something that can be shown to younger children, and hopefully that will stimulate discussion. So you know what I suggest people do is just show them that and then say, what do you think? You know, wow, what do you think about that? Uh, ask questions rather than um, you know make rules and and restrictions. So I'm posing a question to you now, and and again we'll we'll highlight this at the end of the um, two part series. Is are the ways in which we're we're raising and educating children with technology are they sustainable? Um, we're, we're we've got a generation now who has no experience of life without technology. They're very hardwired for high speed. Um, largely passive learners exposed to high levels of sexual and media violence, sedentary, and because of the sedentary factor, our obesity rates are soaring. 
um, in the U.S. now it's one, um, it's, it's greater than 30 percent. In Canada we've just now, recent research has showed we've moved from one in four to now one in three children uh, have obesity. So the, the things that go with obesity such as diabetes and, and cardiovascular problems such as early stroke and heart attack are now um, raising huge flags, red flags within the, the medical community and um, a recent article just released out of New England Journal of Medicine said that we, we are now witnessing the first generation of children, many of whom will not outlive their parents. So, you know, the answer to the question, are they sustainable? No. And we've really got to a lot of work to do um, to start helping kids to get outside more um, and um, get more active if we're going to reverse this, this trend. So again, our agenda for tonight is to look at the usage statistics and then I'm going to be talking about um, one half of that balance, the balanced technology management. I'm going to talk about the critical activities for meeting developmental milestones and foundation skills for school entry. So we're going to talk about what do your children really need to grow and succeed. Uh, and then in our second, uh, second part of the series on December 11th, uh, same time as tonight, we are going to profile the research on the impact of technology on development and then talk about some, some initiatives. Tonight I will end by, um, by also profiling some of the um, free download stuff that's on the website uh, in the realm of, of, of how to help you get started. So we will have some of the to-do stuff tonight as well as um, on the next session. So again, the research that I'll be presenting is um, uh, all collated on a fact sheet that's located on my website. There's over 200 research references, so it's 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 voluminous, <laughs> it's huge, and um, the reason I have it on the website is that it's uh, organized by topic, so by subject, and which helps parents to find what they want easier. And then the research references are all. Uh, uh, alphabetized toward the end of the document and many of them are government websites so you can link directly to the site and get the information um, right on the, the uh, right on the internet if you would like a copies of any of the articles that I talk about any of the research just email info at zone and or if you have any additional questions or information um, please give please give me an email so how much are our kids using um, the, the children zero to two years are watching on average two and a half hours per day of TV and 25% of TVs in the bedrooms. This is something that is very worrisome and, and the Kaiser Foundation when they do a study on usage, tech usage stats every four years and back their last one in 2006 um, that figure was was 15 percent and they thought that that was really high and they were very discouraged when four years later it, it rose up to 25 so many what does this mean in the realm of child development what this means is many children are being lulled to sleep at night with um, TV and, or you know now you know a movie on an iPad or whatever so instead of rocking the ch child asleep holding the child singing to the child and many of you who have older children know you know, you spend hundreds of hours trying to get children to go to sleep. Um, and in, what we're doing now is we're we're replacing the parent in many time in many situations with it with a device. And in the absence of a parent, uh, many children are as a default attaching to these devices. And and this is something that is is very. Um, very damaging to their their mental health and we're seeing a, a exorbitant rise in attachment disorders in children as a result so children really really need their parents in that zero to two year old age they're forming um, the uh, eighty percent of their brain forms in that zero to two year old age so what you expose the child to you expose the child to nurturing loving um, available parents who are listening and reading stories and playing with children you're going to see a really different brain than um, a child who's a, especially an infant or a young toddler who's being put to bed at night with devices many children I work with they cannot sleep without something on 
and yet what happens is the device wakes them up repeatedly in, in the night so they're not getting getting good quality sleep. So our toddlers are in the two to five year range, we're using four and a half hours a day, um, half of them have devices in their bedrooms and when this research was done it was pre-iPad. Now we have transportability um, and it's very, very difficult for parents to monitor where the device is. So, um, you know, kids are taking it into the bathroom, um, crawling under the bed and using it, you know, crawling under their covers at night, waking up in the middle of the night and using devices. So um, with my own daughter, who's 18 now, I, I locked up her stuff in a filing cabinet at night because I, you know, I'd say, okay, so turn that stuff off and I'd go to bed before her and then I'd, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and kind of like wonder where is, you know, where is, what's she doing? And there she would be in her, in her bedroom, you know, she'd taken whatever off the, we had this thing, leave it on the table, she's taken it off the table, taken it to bed. So anyway, I locked it, I, luckily I had a, a locking file cabinet, I just locked everything up. Um, and that's really what is necessary. Um, here I, you know, I'm an occupational therapist. My my daughter's fairly, you know, well behaved and whatever, and, and I had to resort to those those uh, measures so um, to manage her usage, right? So the children that eight to eighteen years are using about a third of their, you know, day um, with technology, and and many of them have devices in their bedrooms. And these statistics reflect only entertainment technologies, not education technologies. And they also don't include passive TV watching, which is 75% um, of our homes just leave the TV on all day. And so that's termed passive watching when the TV's on and you're not sitting watching it um, and doesn't include educational use. So what are the experts recommending? Well, uh, you saw on the slideshow that the zero to two year olds shouldn't be exposed to any technology, even passive technology. They've been finding when the uh, background TV is on, it really impacts on their speech, um, uh, their ability to speak, as well as uh, nap times and, and sleep, quality of sleep. Uh, the background TV has quite an impact on that for our, our, our little guys, the two to five year, year range shouldn't use more than an hour a day and the five to 12 years not more than one to two hours per day. So that's where American Academy of Pediatrics came out with those guidelines in 2004 and it was followed by our, by our Canadian Pediatric Society in 2010. Um, one of the difficult areas about tech is the supervision and I've already talked a bit about that. Um, what the Kaiser Foundation study found was that um, only a third of kids have any rules at all regarding tech use and those kids use 30% less. So I want to say that again because <laughs> this is really uh, the crux of, of where we're going with this is we do have to start making some rules around tech use and um, what again what I suggest you doing is doing that as a family, as a group but um, the parents really need to take control here and start putting some rules in place because you will get much less less usage. So I don't know if you heard even today they had some information on um, Facebook not taking any responsibility for the the underage kids that are using it. Well, you know, Consumer Reports uh, reported in 2011 that five million children under the age of 10 have accounts, and that um, very low supervision rates for these children. So we all um, know the problems that, that happen with um, unsupervised kids on the internet. So again, this kind of multi-platform transportability, it really makes it difficult for parents to monitor it. And I, I totally suggest getting something you can lock everything in. So what are the critical factors for, for development and learning? Like what are those things that we want our kids to be exposed to, the environments that we want to um, have them engage in so that, that we can expect optimal development and learning when children grow up. So the foundations for early development are that kids need to touch and be touched. Lots of rough and tumble play, lots of hugs, lots of cuddling um, at night when they're, you know, they're upset. They need human connection without which they will die. We know that from studies that touch and human connection are two powerful, powerful um, components of, of optimal development. Kids need to move a lot. 
and I'm going to talk about what type of movement that they actually need, the type of sensory input they need to develop core and motor coordination, and those things are really important to be able then to learn, to be able to print, to be able to read, um, to be able, be able to play sports. So what we're really seeing right now is that um, our child's foundation has really cracked and it, an easy way to explain development to parents is that um, you know growing a child is a bit like building a house it is all about that foundation it's about who builds it you know did you get the right materials in there at the proper timing um, and these things just aren't happening for our kids so we're seeing children with touch deprivation very similar to um, orphanage children. I see a lot of children who are touch deprived, very anxious, depressed, um, uh, having real difficulty with a lot of anxiety. We're seeing very sedentary children um, with resulting obesity, diabetes, um, very low motivation levels. And then we're seeing a lot of social isolation. So kids who are going home after school and, and um, you know, the parents, as you saw in the slideshow, thinking, you know, oh, it's uh, um, the safest place for my child is at home. You know, when I'm when I'm working till six, and well, what are they going to do at home? You know, they're they're they've got to do something, right? So the tech's there, and and so we're seeing um, a lot of socialization, and with that comes a social social problems, social phobias, um, addictions, and and aggression. So this is my uh, uh, I have two. Um, graphics that I've created that will help you sort of maneuver yourself through the, the maze of, of what is how to create a sustainable child and um, alternatively my my next my other slide that I'm going to show further on into the presentation is um, what's happening in the realm of, of technology impacting on unsustainability or creating unsustainable children so we're going to move through each of um, each of these hierarchical sections and the bottom one is really the components for the critical factors for optimal development and learning so again children need to move and touch and connect with each other and be exposed to nature and that um, that stimulates different systems the, and I'm going to talk just briefly about each of these in the next couple slides and when these systems are stimulated we see children who are strong and coordinated secure they, they're very regulated um, you know they can they can accommodate change and transitions and they're calm and focused and then of course they're developing op developing optimally so they can attend and learn and and are sustainable so movement um, this is the real area that um, is of the largest concern to the medical community is the sedentariness of tech because kids aren't sedentary for no reason they're sedentary because there's something really stimulating uh, for them to play with while they're sitting there so uh, it's pretty hard to get kids moving um, you know when they've got a lot of tech around that's that's not managed well so technology deprives children of necessary vestibular and proprioceptive stimulation and I'm going I'm to talk about each one of those because it's important uh, for parents to understand when we say movement, what, what do we actually mean about that? When we say go out and play, what do we really want them to do? Um, there's two systems I'm, gonna, I'm going to discuss. One is called the vestibular system. It's it's a series of canals that's located inside the brain. It's often referenced as the inner ear because it's an extension of the ear. And in those canals, the canals are placed in different planes. And in these canals is fluid. And this fluid uh, moves. Whenever a child moves off their center of gravity, this fluid moves. And what happens is it sends, there's hair cells in, in the canals and when they move, they send a message to the brain that sends a message to the body to come back to center. So let's imagine a child on a swing and the swing is swinging forward and that the gravity, gravitational forces are kind of pushing the child backward off the swing. That vestibular system kicks in and it goes, whoa, you're going to fall over backwards. Contract front, contract front, bring into center, bring into center. So all the muscles on the front of the, the neck and the, the trunk and the legs contract to bring that child into center. Now the swing swings the other way and the child gravitational forces are pushing the child off the swing forward. And the vestibular system says, contract back, 
and then the whole back of the child's body contracts, brings the child into center. Imagine a child on a, on a merry-go-round. The vestibular system would be constantly active, telling the brain to tell the body to come into center. So imagine, um, remember the old swings and the old slides, how they used to be really, really tall, and the vestibular input was, was really intense with these, all these devices, climbing trees, any sort of swinging, jumping, running, gives vestibular stimulation. This is absolutely crucial for core, for, for setting core stability for the, for the child's body. And only when a child has a stable core can they develop coordination, which is so necessary for all that we do. So coordination of both sides of the body, coordination of upper body to lower body, coordination of the eyes to the hand for printing and reading, coordination of both eyes with each other for reading is all um, enhanced and and uh, with vestibular stimulation. So our children who are not moving are not getting any stimulation to the vestibular system and what we're seeing as therapists is a huge preponderance of children with low, what we call low core tone. They are floppy kids um, who can't hold their head up, who are drooling, you know, and they're, they're like two years old. And uh, we're seeing a lot of developmental delay predominantly because they're not getting this type of movement. So the other type of, of stimulation they need in, in the realm of movement is to their proprioceptive system or their muscles and their joints. And when we, when a child works hard, when we say, here, you carry the groceries, and, you know, no, you rake, rake the leaves today, you dig a hole in the ground so that I can plant this plant. When we make them work hard, um, like when they fall over and they're, they're just, you know, learning to walk, say they're nine or 10 months old and they kind of fall over. When we rush in there and we pick them up and stand them up, we're actually preventing that proprioceptive system from developing. So I'm seeing a lot of over, um, overly involved parents, especially with the younger kids. And these young children are spending a huge amount of time um, being catered to, uh, being in strollers in these white bucket seats, I call them, you know, but the car seats for the infants, spending far too much time uh, in these devices and far too little time crawling around on the floor, falling over, getting up, um, walking themselves. So um, this proprioceptive stimulation is really uh, integral for refining movements that are that are needed for for doing all sports, but but printing is and reading as well. And when children get enough proprioceptive stimulation, they get really. Uh, it's like they're like a little pressure cooker, and this energy just builds up, and then they blow. So when kids are um, doing hard work, heavy work there's an energy drain, there's an energy, an actual drop in, in energy that helps children to stay more relaxed and calm. So movement is absolutely integral for development and learning. Touch. Um, technology overuse deprives children of, of necessary touch. Sorry, I'm skipping forward here. Touch is a biological necessity without which infants die. And we know that from orphanage studies. And, and what um, many studies have shown is that when children are touched, they're secure, they're gentle, they're relaxed. It actually changes their, um, their digestive system, their development parameters. Um, touch is absolutely integral for development and mental health and security. So inadequate touch, what we're seeing a lot of is a lot of anxiety, huge anxiety in children, um, fear, uh, agitation, and so, and those things really prevent children from, from learning and doing well, especially in school environments. Connection, obviously when we're connected to devices, we are disconnected from our children. So we're seeing um, a huge problem with, um, unhealthy attachment formations or dysfunctional attachment formations. And, and I'm also seeing what I term the triple disconnect, that this connection to technology is really isolating children and it's, it's disconnecting them from developing their own self-identity. Um, many children I see, they have no identity other than being a video game character. Um, it's, it's disconnecting children from each other, from nature, and, you know, we're, we really are, as a family, we are designed to uh, be a member of a pack. And if we think back 
um, you know, in, in uh, times when families lived together, say on a farm, you know, they all got up at four and every child had a job they had to do. And if that child didn't do that job, then, you know, their family just wouldn't survive. And so um, now we're very disconnected. Children don't have a purpose. They don't have meaning in life. They don't have a job to do. I always say to parents, you know, every child, no matter, even if they're two years old, should have something they do every single day. And if they don't do that thing, whatever that job, whatever it is, um, that they, they should feel like their family is just going to fall apart. I mean, even a, a two-year-old, you could, you know, you could have them empty the silverware, you know, into the, you know, out of the dishwasher into the drawer and, and oh my gosh, you know, you didn't do that yesterday morning and I thought, you know, life was going to end for our whole family. Like, children need meaning and purpose and, and really need to feel they're part of a pack and, and the increasing suicide has been directly related to that, um, that uh, lack of meaning and lack of purpose in, in children's lives. So um, this is interesting research that was um, reported in the Guardian News in, in the UK, but one, I just think it's astounding really, one in five parents report they don't know how to play with their children. So this is something our, our um, uh, current parent population, parents of young children, who were maybe raised with, uh, you know, on TV themselves, never really uh, learned how to play with their children. And part of what I do as a therapist when I work one-to-one -one, um, with children is I specify that I, I don't work just with the child, you know, I work with the family and I teach the family basically how to play with the child. Um, and this is something that that we all, whether you're a health or an education professional um, or a parent, you know, we really have to understand that many parents don't know how to play and, and they get really um, almost embarrassed or threatened with um, with play a play scenario and so they grab their device and I've seen it I work I work all over the British Columbia and I've, I've seen it in many different communities um, the default to the device because of not feeling comfortable in a social um, scenario with your child so one in three parents report playing with their child's boring and and you know what compared to wow doing your emails and um, Facebooking and you know blogging and and um, watching you know great movies and TV uh, it is you know and this is uh, you know what's happened is we've gotten to a point where uh, we are so overstimulated um, that the requirement for stimulation is really really high and our threshold you know is really really high we need a lot of stimulation it has to come fast and hard and, and quick and we you know two three devices running at the same time um, you know is, is kind of where we've gone and so of course lying on the floor and staring at your young baby and, and interacting um, is boring and that I hear it all the time from parents and and uh, sad but true and what we have to do is as um, professionals in helping these parents is is teach them the joys of human interaction of touching their children and how to play with their children really really important and how to interact when they are playing with their children so this is something that I've termed um, uh, all right, it's another concept that's coming forward is something um, that I've turned tech neglect is that many parents are severely neglecting their children. This is um, brain scans of, an, of two three-year-old children, one who has been exposed to a normal attachment scenario, normal environment, the other to extreme neglect. So I show this, it's, it's very powerful, um, it's a very powerful slide, but what you do with your children, the environment you expose your children to will directly impact on their brain development. Enriched environments, uh, give you big brains with um, uh, lots of coping skills and, and academic um, abilities, uh, deprived environments, not so much. So it, it's, um, it's very important to remember that, you know, especially with very, very young children, that zero to two year old population and even older, um, even up to the age of 12, that what you do with your children dramatically affects their brain development and, and their future success in life. So nature, um, we 
are of this um, stage right now where we're really feeling like nature isn't safe, that outside isn't safe. And what studies show is that uh, parents who believe that out there isn't safe, um, their children use can significantly more technology. So, um, and I, I, I blame media a bit for this. Uh, you know, I, like I listen to CBC all the time. I'm usually in the car driving somewhere, so I listen to CBC radio. And, you know, and I might hear, you know, if I'm in the car traveling somewhere all day, I might hear 20 times, you know, about a child who was abducted in, you know, somewhere down in Louisiana and, and you know horrible things happen and I hear it over and over again and oh my gosh I, I just thank thank God my, my children are older now um, and I don't have to worry so much about that but wow when, when my children were young I worried about that a lot and to hear it over and over and over again so the more we listen and surround ourselves to these technologies the more we hear things that are going to scare us and so is the world more unsafe today? I, I don't have any idea. I have no idea. But, but what I encourage parents to do is think about, um, think about all the great things that nature can give to their children and how to make it safe. Um, you know, how to connect with other parents on the block and one parent takes all the kids to the you know, park, um, you know, or some, some ways to make getting outside uh, more safe. So I want to... Um, uh, show you a film clip from a, a, a really cool movie called Play Again, and you can um, uh, you can access that. Uh, um, you just Google it, and it'll show you how to get it. Human history seems pretty grounded in defeating natural challenges. So being like connected with nature, like to the point where you feel like tied to it in a way doesn't seem essential. Probably during the day I send about like 300 or 400 or 500 text messages. But in school, only about 100. Video games is more entertaining than playing outside for me because when I play video games, I'm like in my own little world. I control what's happening. It's fun, if not more fun, than using computers just because it's something I've never experienced before, really. It's like trying all these new things that you never thought you could do. Like, I did not know I could make a bow and arrow that actually, like, shot. Kind of strange how much it means to me. A television, you know, like it shouldn't mean that much to you if you miss it, or you shouldn't be upset and frustrated. I, I, I feel like I'm missing out on so much by not going on my space, which I love. Like I feel like I'm just gonna be so like it's so hard. virtual world where you may not be missing out and there's the real world which you will be living in um, you're definitely missing out if you have older children I strongly suggest getting that DVD um, it's great to show at schools um, uh, you know in community group settings so, you know, really ask that question, what are the consequences of a child removed from nature? 
So nature is a, a great healer and there's so much research. Um, University of Illinois has a really awesome website that's been uh, started regarding helping people to understand a little bit more about the, you know, all the positive aspects of nature. There was a group of researchers um, led by Faber Taylor in 2004 that, that found uh, inner city children had three times the ADHD as rural children. And so subsequent research showed that it was actually rural children have much um, more access to what they termed green space. And they went on to find that really only 20 minutes per day, that's, this research study is called a walk in the park, 20 minutes per day can, can actually uh, completely reduce ADHD so that it's not problematic in a school setting. So, you know, we have to maybe then ask ourselves, like, why are we medicating these children? Why are we, um, you know, when we know that movement and nature can so enhance their attention and, and ability to learn. So um, we also know that autism improves with movement and nature. Um, touch, connection are also um, found to improve so much of the, um, the different uh, mental illnesses that are prevalent in our society today. So, you know, we are a pill popping society and we've really gone a long ways away from kind of that common sense knowledge of let's just, let's just, t let's just tell those kids to go outside and play. Um, there's so much that happens when we tell kids to go outside and play. They move, they touch, they, they connect with other human beings and they're exposed to nature and, and all of those things have a huge impact on their ability to pay attention and learn as well as to develop. So what are some of the things that you can do? Um, if you visit my website, uh, there is um, uh, on the, the right side, kind of toward the top, there's uh, a section where you can access um, free downloads. There's also, you can sign up for, for a, I do a monthly newsletter that is um, very research focused. So there's, um, I, I have a number of different people that, that send me research articles and, and so I do links to those articles in the newsletter as well as uh, profile different news articles that are happening. Um, I'm usually in the news, um, like I was on CBC The National last month, so I'll have a link to, um, you know, anything that I'm saying in the news. And the most important thing about these newsletters is that I do a monthly um, article that is, that usually springs off of some new research that was, um, I've ran across and that was presented to me by others. So um, this is uh, an area that um, I think we all just have to, to be really uh, constantly keeping up on is the research and what, you know, what are people saying? Because when we start looking at what we're going to do, it really should be based on the evidence that we have um, there ahead, of, there in front of us. Um, so, what I, what is one of the free downloads? There is my ten steps to unplug your children from technology. So it's it's a two pager. It's made to be kind of small and concise so that uh, it's not something that's unmanageable by families. So I want to just move through these 10 steps and of course in the in the um, article itself they're expanded on much more so than in this one slide. But the first the first thing again I just said is get informed and you're here tonight and you're going to go away and tell other people about some of the stuff you learned tonight. So very important to get informed and, and please remember that there is the fact sheet on the website that has a tremendous amount of information. I think it's like I don't know, I printed it off, maybe 30 pages of um, uh, the research references and, and all the, uh, the information. So it's a very, lot of, lot of work has gone into that. And um, as well, I have a book called, um, I've recently published a book called Virtual Child, The Terrifying Truth About What Technology is Doing to Children. And that's available, available on Amazon.com. So again, that's Virtual Child, The Terrifying Truth About What Technology is Doing to Children. And that too is full of a tremendous amount of information. It's um, separated into three sections. So it talks about the problems um, and then 
it's uh, and then it talks about the critical factors for the developing child like what do children need so and how can we give it to them and then the last section is is solutions and um, profiles a number of initiatives that I term balanced technology management initiatives um, that we can employ in different sectors. So get informed. The other, the second thing is we really have to disconnect ourselves first and this is the hardest thing as parents and I went through as, as you know, a parent for my children, you know, is, is Katie would be, you know, mom, mom, I, you know, I want to tell you something and, and I'd be just a minute, just a minute, I just like, just got to finish this, like 14 emails and, you know, it never was 14 emails, it, it was 30 or, you know, and then I'd be, you know, on some, something on Explorer and anyway, it's, um, it's something that we, we have to do is we have to make ourselves available for our children. So working on first as parents, disconnecting yourself and creating what I term, and this takes us into number three, sacred time for your children. So what I um, recommend is an hour a day, a day a week, and a week a year that you designate as sacred time with no tech. So, and, and during this time, a reconnection will happen. So the hour a day, I suggest around dinner. So dinner preparation, dinner, dinner eating, dinner cleanup is all done tech free. And the tech should go in a drawer. It should go um, somewhere where you are not gonna hear the vibration and the, the um, you know, the, the ringer. So it, it, it might be, you know, uh, filing cabinets are great. They're kind of metal, <laughs> they muffle the sound a bit. And uh, they certainly worked for me. We had for, for dinner, we had a basket that everybody would throw their stuff in. And I oftentimes, if I was kind of like mad, I'd throw it in the closet or something. Uh, you know, anyway, it, the tech all went in the basket and, and everybody had to leave it in there for a whole hour. Um, so this is difficult and TV's off. And, and this was a time of reconnection and was very powerful. Um, many families know how difficult it is to, to actually start reconnecting with your children, with your partner. Um, we, we live in a time of disconnection, so this is not an easy step number three. Um, what I suggest doing is creating some little games around the, the dinner table, so um, you go around and say, what's one good thing that happened to you today and one bad thing that happened to you today, or you know, have a different sort of theme each night for um, how you're going to reconnect. Maybe throw a, a you know, deck of cards in the middle of the table and play a game of rummy while you're eating. Um, if, if you know the reconnection is really difficult you know get get a diversion but make it something you can do together as a family so exploring alternate activities is so important prior to a disconnect prior to to um, reducing the use of technology there needs to be activities that children can engage in that are um, that are that are uh, good alternatives. So, I mean, when I go to communities, I first of, first and foremost, I go to the playgrounds and I see what's going on there, you know, and many playgrounds are dilapidated um, and have very infantile um, devices, you know, like the swings are short or gone. Swings have disappeared from the landscape of, of Canadian society. Um, merry grounds pretty much gone. So the things that are giving our kids lots of vestibular stimulation are, are you know, uh, have been deemed to be unsafe. And, and, well, if they're unsafe, let's just get rid of them. So, you know, slides are really short. So many of our playgrounds really are not very interesting for a child beyond the age of five. And that we really need to start looking at different ways to create playgrounds. And I, I have a, a webinar on playgrounds. Um, a lot of my work is actually working with communities in uh, creating alternate activities to pull children and their families, you know, their parents out outside to the playground, to the park. I'm a real advocate of, of putting in this adult exercise equipment. I don't know if you've ever seen this out, it's outdoor, very like um, vandalism proof um, exercise equipment that's actually bolted to this to the cement, to the sidewalk or to a cement pad. And, um, and adding, you know, some picnic tables and benches and let's cover an area next to the playground or even cover the whole playground so that um, children aren't exposed 
exposed to ultraviolet light rays, they're not exposed to rain, you know. So we can create spaces where that will draw families there, draw, you know, activity and conversation and, and start um, making it easier for kids to disconnect or to reduce the use of technology. Enhancing skills is really important. A lot of kids, they don't know how to do anything other than video games. Um, they really don't and so it's the parents responsibility especially if the parents don't know how to do anything else to start looking at skill enhancement so let's all go swimming let's take those swimming lessons on Saturday morning let's all um, go to uh, um, you know go for a hike you know on Saturday afternoons every day so actually I just have to go back to number three when I was talking about sacred time I said an hour a day the day a week I suggest to be Saturday, that no tech, um, possibly when the kids get to bed at night, you know, the parents can haul their stuff out again, but um, that, that you have chores and you have activities and, and that, that's a day where things get done and, and um, activities happen on Saturday. And then the week a year, of course, is the family holiday and that's a tough one and I, I struggled with that with my family and extended family, um, you know, Oh, she's gonna make us leave everything at home again. But you know what? After about three days, it's amazing how much fun you can have without tech. You know, uh, families are made for having fun, and and uh, to leave the tech at home is so important. So, getting lots of that movement, touch, connection, and nature, addressing your perceptions of safety. So, talk to your partner. You know, do you think it's it's okay, you know, if we let our 12-year-old get on the bike and go down to the, you know, corner store and get a quart of milk, like, you know, is that is that okay? Is that safe? Um, because I'm not going to tell parents to do things that are not safe. Obviously, uh, it's it's their it's parents' own decision. But discuss it with your partner. And generally speaking, one partner, um, you know, has more of a lighter attitude about things, and other the other partner is kind of like, oh, you know, nothing's safe, right? So. Um, it's good to kind of like address those perceptions because children do need to get outside and they do need to explore and they need to form independent behaviors and, and that all happens, you know, outside. So creating those individual roles to fuel that inner drive, give every kid a job. Every child should have a job. Schedule the balance. Um, oftentimes what I suggest to parents is schedule in an hour in equals an hour out. I'm going to show you a schedule in just a few slides. So. If a child's been on the computer for an hour, they've got to go out and they've got to do a lot of movement for an hour um, or read a book to their sibling or, you know, empty the dishwasher like um, that, that energy in should equal energy out. And linking up with communities like there are a lot of communities now are doing like a one week unplug um, campaigns where they're, you know, offering free gym and swimming and, you know, rec passes for the week um, to reconnect people with community and, and enhance um, community. So uh, on my website under the free downloads is also the tech screen. It's good to figure out how much are you using, how much are your kids using. And with kids, um, what I found was that you can't really say how much tech are you using. I can't even say that to adults. They haven't a clue, really. So the way I've designed the screen is, is how much is your child using before school, after school? Let's break it down. Um, you know, during dinner, do you use tech during dinner, after dinner, prior to bed, you know, during the night and on weekends too. Like what's a weekend like? Uh, and that gives you some idea of a weekly usage rate because um, it's, it's important and then divide by seven and there's your daily rate. And with the experts recommending the one to two hours, it's, and our average is seven and a half per day um, for our, our, um, our average child. It, it is important when you're looking at problematic uh, behaviors with children, such as aggression or um, obesity, uh, um, mental illness, anxiety, uh, a lot of these things. If you're seeing things that are related to tech overuse, then and you you do a screen and you see your family is really using a lot, then that just gives a little more fuel for um, for redu reduction. So family traditions is um, always a great way to go. So we always had Monday night 
you know, was was cookie night actually <laughs> in our family, and we made cookies every Monday night, and oftentimes we didn't bake them. Um, we ate the dough for two or three days, right? And then they'd be gone. Um, and sometimes we bake them. So anyway, start thinking about uh, a theme for each night, and that there's you know a game night definitely. You know that the whole family comes together definitely and cooks. Um, you know that there's a movie night, uh, a music night that you're going to play loud music and do chores or something. So think of these family traditions. Here's a, here's a schedule. It's important to really schedule. So educate your family, determine you know these healthy alternatives, and then really write a schedule. So this is this is just an example of, of what you can get off the website where you can schedule balance between tech and and activity. So. Um, this uh, concludes our section, and um, I, for whatever reason, actually, I'm just going to window down here because I was going to take some questions at the end. Um, I have lost our. Uh, there, there we go. Let's. I, you're seeing now my daughter. My daughter's in the middle there. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that so that I could see the questions. Um, so uh, anyway, my daughter that she designed that dress actually. She's pretty spectacular, and those are her two friends she got at this last year. So um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to read the question here. Um, so we got as a teacher. So do you, Melissa, do you want to go ahead and read the question? Yeah, I'll read it for you. It might make it a little easier. Um, we had a question here um, from Angela. And it's interesting because I know we have teachers and parents joining us tonight and she say, she's a teacher and she, she says that she feels the need to engage students in technology to keep them up to speed as they move into junior grades. But she's the parent of a four-year-old and a six-year-old and at home she limits the use of technology. So I think she's bringing up an interesting point about being a teacher in the classroom and needing to almost utilize technology to stay up to speed and and I wonder if you've, you know, thought about that or um, because I know technology is so much more prominent in schools. Do you have kind of an opinion of that or a thought of that? Yeah. And what what we have not covered, I want, I want to make this really clear, is we have not covered the impact of tech on children. And that is part two. Um, I've done this workshop a couple hundred times and um, what I found was when I started with kind of the doom and gloom people were uh, they they just were kind of so overwhelmed that it was um, very difficult to kind of move forward and this is the feedback that I got on my evaluations that I gave after the end of the workshop so I haven't talked at all about these what you see on the slide here now which is our next session is we're gonna look at what happens physically socially mentally and what the question is about is academically and what um, what what there's a, a huge preponderance in the education system to say you know these kids need all this tech because you know they got you know this is the the future and and they really have to know how to use it and but there's absolutely no research that shows much of this technology does anything other than entertain the kids and a large amount of time is spent using the entertainment components of the technology even while they're in school so um, and I'm not saying that that technology does not teach to children but what we have to be really careful of is this um, you know it's like we're on this tech train that's just going 100 miles an hour and, and kids are falling off because they're using way too much so even in the school system I really advocate that we start looking at at what I call a, a risk benefit ratio whenever we're considering using tech education tech so that the teacher would <clears throat> the teacher would be saying okay so you know what's the risk of, of using this well we've got kids who are using an average seven and a half hours a day so they've got a lot on board when they're coming into school um, you know what are some other risks of using it and then and then look at the benefits and say wow but the benefits are amazing because you know this tech enables the children to do all these different things well then you that's the tech you want to use 
but I mean I walk into classrooms all the time or work in schools right and you know teachers got the whole class playing snakes and ladders you know on the smart board and the kids are all lined up and they're not even like moving the game pieces themselves the teachers doing it from a you know from her laptop or whatever and and I'm kind of going okay well what's this about you know <laughs> what what's the benefit here the kids are not moving they're sedentary um, they're bored because they're having to watch all the other kids move around the game scores. Anyway, um, you know, just to, just to touch on this topic, we will talk about it more um, on our next session, but it is education technology is a real uh, huge hot topic right now, is, and, and the big question is, is it educational? So I advocate for grades K to 3, no tech, and then in the school setting, and then start using the tech in grade 4. Um, so that we teach kids how to print because a lot of kids don't know how to print, they don't know how to read. Um, this tech has really replaced a lot of the basics, teaching of the basics. And certainly for this teacher's little guys at home, I think four and six year old, um, again, the, the recommendations are an hour a day. So if they can you know, keep within those limits. Awesome, wonderful answer to that. And and there is so much to talk about um, with this topic. That, that is why we separated this into kind of a part one and part two. Um, if you want to join us for the part two of the series, it's happening Tuesday, December 11th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I have put the link up in the little chat box that each person um, has there. It should be on your little dashboard. So if you click there, there's a link directly to there so you can kind of register for that one um, as well. Um, Chris, thank you for being a leader for parents and teachers to really be the person to gather this data and to put it together in such a, in such a wonderful way for us to learn today about all this information. Um, I know we didn't have too much time for questions, but if, if anybody here joining us has any more questions about this topic, I know that you can feel free to email Chris directly. Um, Chris, is your email info at zonein.ca? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I'm just going to type that here for everybody. Um, we'll put that in that little text box. There you go. And you can also visit her website, um, zonein.ca, um, to gather a lot of the um, sheets that she was talking about earlier on in the talk. Um, this is actually Scholars Choice's first webinar. This is a new series that um, we're launching and we're hosting many more to come. Um, it's going to be on a number of different, to different topics that relate to both teachers and parents. And to know about webinars first, please like us on Facebook because that's often where we promote, um, where we happen to promote these webinars first. So I've also got a link to the Facebook page in that chat box. And we are putting a recording of this webinar up on Facebook um, in the next few days. So if you joined us today and you know that this would be a really great topic to share with other parents um, and other friends that you have that, that, um, that you feel like this um, you know, this could make a difference for them. You're going to be able to have the link to, uh, to share around through Facebook as well. Um, so everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you so much for, thank you so much, Chris, for being such a wonderful, a wonderful host and, uh, have a really fantastic night, everybody. And we hope to see you Tuesday, December 11th for part two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.